see how this works. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, great. First, I want to thank you guys for being here. I know there are two tracks, and I won't be insulted if you don't like what I'm saying and you just want to leave. <laughs> totally cool with me. I want to provide a lot of value to you, and I'm glad we're talking about the theme of leveling up. And the specific area that I want to talk about is client interaction. I, I see a lot of faces here, and, and I hope that some of you guys here are freelancers or thinking about starting your own agency. Maybe you're at an agency right now and you're kind of plotting and going like this, biding your time, thinking about the Dr. Evil plan, right? So I, I hope to provide a lot of value to you today. The first thing I want to say is this is, my, I'm, this is my second or third time back at Cal State LA and I'm thrilled to be here. The first time I was invited to be here was in 2007. I was speaking about design for AIGA. And I gotta tell you, uh, in my mind, it was gonna be a super awesome, amazing opportunity to speak and share what I know, talk about things I'm passionate about. Mind you now, that was, uh, let's see here, 95, seven, like 12 years after I graduated from school. So you think I would know what I'm talking about. So in my mind, it was gonna be like this, right? But it didn't work out that way. It worked out more like this. Because I was a nervous wreck. Uh, my, my heart was beating out of my chest and my, my palms are sweaty and something about spaghetti. <laughs> and so today, I'm, I'm really here, and it's about the redemption, the, the comeback story, if you will. Okay? So hopefully I'll do okay, and if not, just boo and say whatever. You can heckle me. It's all fine. And before I dive too deep into the topic at hand, I want to talk about having a purpose. And having a purpose, I thought I had a purpose until I saw something that Jack Canfield talked about. And having a purpose is, beyond money, why do you exist? And for a long time, I thought my purpose was to make enough money to provide for my family, my two kids, take care of them, and to ultimately work hard enough so I don't have to work anymore. So my purpose was to retire. And I wanted to retire as young as possible so I could enjoy the rest of my life. But then I realized something. If you work to retire, it's kind of hard to get up in the morning to work to retire. When you hit those roadblocks, and you're having difficult moments with clients or employees, or you can't get past that creative hurdle and it's two in the morning, that's not really a purpose. So I wanna share with you what my purpose is because although I talk about money and business, I don't wanna lose sight of why we exist. And I think you guys need to start looking at that. So my purpose and why I'm here is to teach a million people the business of design and to empower creatives to achieve their dreams. So I hope to impart some of what I've learned in the last 20 years as a working professional and share it with you. So I have about you know, 999,800 more to go. I was told there were 200 people, but we're a little shy of that, so I'll change the number after this. <laughs> it's all about accuracy, right? So having a purpose is also about having a really big goal. Having a big goal means it's a quantum leap forward in your life, in your career, in your business, whatever it is that, that you're pursuing. And that quantum leap and that goal that you have, it's not so much, uh, it's not that important that you achieve that goal, but it's about the person you become in trying to achieve that goal. So just think about that. It's the journey that matters there. So the goal is, is, is a destination, but we think about who we have to become. So many of you guys, hold on a second, maybe feel this way with your clients, frustrated a little bit. Yeah, you can raise your hand if you want. Uh, this is a popular sentiment. My clients have really bad taste. There's articles written about this by leading design professionals, why your clients suck, <laughs> okay? Oh my God, my clients aren't listening to me. What's wrong with them? They just ruined the work. Clients ruined the work. It started out good at the beginning and then somewhere along the way it got really ugly. And so you can't even show it to your friends. <laughs> Here's another popular idea. I need to educate the client. You hear that? They teach you this in school. Educate the client. And at the end of the day, we're not appreciated at all for the work that we do. The many hours. It's a thankless job sometimes. Okay, so now I'm going to launch into this. I think I have six points or seven, but I woke up at five this morning. I changed some things, so I don't know how many points I have left. But <laughs> let's start with the, my clicker's not, the artist persona. The artist persona. What I want you to do today is to think about this, is to let go of the artist's persona. All right? I know. I know. <laughs> oh, don't say it. You can leave. It's fine. <laughs> I, I won't be offended. The artist's persona, I want to talk about this a little bit. To, to me, Jackson Pollock, he's an artist. He, you know, Jack the Dripper, right? 
Van Gogh, he's an artist. Andy Warhol, he's an artist. He's an artist. And so here we are at this kind of fork in the road. And we have to make a big decision in our lives. Because to me, an artist is a person who really works for themselves. They want to work on cultivating what their perspective is on the world. And they want to share that. But they don't exist to serve any particular client or purpose other than sharing their unique vision with the world. And if those artists are hardworking, are passionate enough or have an interesting idea or concept and they're at the right place at the right time, maybe with a little bit of luck, they go into the national, international stage and they become really rich. And it's a fantasy because only very few select people ever make it to that stage. So here we are at this road and where I say to the left, we work for ourselves. And to the right, we have clients. But we need to make a choice because oftentimes a lot of the artist types they basically work in some kind of low rent district. They have some kind of warehouse or artist studio and they paint or they sculpt and they make things. They don't get paid very much, if anything at all. And it's a pursuit of passion. It's not sustainable and it's a very tough life to live. And I think that's why I think most of you guys are here because you're working professionals. You want to have a career. You want to provide for your family. So we have to just now embrace the fact that we actually have clients. All right, so if we understand that, we'll stop complaining about our clients because they're the ones who make our lifestyle, our art, our design, our passion possible. So I, just suspend disbelief for a second. I know your, your disbelief is he's a sellout, he's up here, he's going to just brainwash us, but I don't know, just hang on for a second, okay? So the number one question whenever I go out and speak, and I'm doing that more often these days, is why do clients have such bad taste? Why is that? And I think it's because we have this idea that when a client hires us, that they're really helping to build our portfolio. And that's a classic mistake. And it's a mistake that I've made. I see my students make this. I see freelancers who work for us make this. And I'll share one example with you. Early on, I was doing storyboards for main titles. And I was hired by Kyle Cooper at RGA LA, now Imaginary Forces, to do storyboards for main title. And I didn't care if they won the job or lost it in the pitch. I didn't care at all. All I wanted to do was make really cool boards. And it was kind of like design masturbation. It was really just about <laughs> pleasing myself. It was a very selfish act, right? And some people still work to this day just thinking about their portfolio. You don't really serve your clients very well. So these were some of the first year mistakes that I made. And I got out of school in 1995. And then with the big bright idea that I'm going to start my company right away without any experience or clients. So I'm going to share a little bit with you some of the first year mistakes because I've gone up and down this arc many times when we've grown and we've been reduced down to nothing and I think we're going to go out of business. And some of the lessons I've learned in the last 20 years I hope to impart with you to make you more powerful to be able to avoid those same mistakes. And the benefit of having a great relationship with your client is manyfold, and I want you to think about that for a second. First, it's because you become more valuable. If you provide a great service, it's a website, an app, a design, a brand, messaging, a logo, anything like that, you become more valuable to your clients. And when I say valuable, usually that has money or dollars attached to that. So if you're tired of working on you know two, three, four, five thousand dollar sites, I think you have to start thinking about the value you provide to them. The other benefit of having a great client relationship is the ability to get more work from them. Now, I will talk a little bit later about sales and marketing, but everybody always says, I, my sales is through word of mouth. Well, what are they saying about you? Oh yeah, my designer was trying to educate me. That's really insulting. They want to tell me about my business and about how I'm ruining the design. That's not the kind of word of mouth that you want. The kind of word of mouth that I get are clients who call me and they literally have said this, you should charge me more. Don't tell my partner that. <laughs> okay? And when I meet with clients, they often refer me and are kind of like, it's almost embarrassing when they talk about me in front of other people. And it's great, because this is how I grow my business, I grow my practice, and I'm getting to the right kind of clients. Like all of us dream of working for those big companies. For you guys, it might be Nike, if you're a sports person, it could be Lululemon, it could be any one of these brands. But where you're at today, 
you're not going to be able to get there. And the only way you can get there is to do great work for good clients who appreciate the work that you do, and they recommend you to friends, and they just keep going higher and higher. So I'm really thrilled to tell you, as of this year, and it's taken me 20 years to get here, I'm working now with clients directly with our first ever publicly traded company. And that's amazing, and the result of that, uh, the, the, the reason why I have that is because I service a different client to the best of my ability, and that client will call me up on a Friday evening and just tell me, I'm calling you just to tell you, I really appreciate you, man, I like the work, have a great weekend. Do your clients do that? Do you want that? I do. So we gotta start thinking about the client relationship dynamic to be much different. And last of all, and probably most importantly, is if you change the dynamic, you'll be much happier. We're doing this thing, and I often run into this, a lot of designers will tell me they have a passion project. It, and I'm always confused by that. I thought you did design or, or web or whatever it is that you do, and that was your passion. But because of your process was so difficult, you have to, have, you have to now have a hobby from your hobby. And that's a crazy idea to me, right? Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to kind of be more empathetic. We have to understand what it's like to be a client. Some of you guys have been clients before, so I want you to think about that. What is it to be a client? Because oftentimes we're just looking at it from our side of the table. So one way to phrase this, because I've been a client and I serve clients well, freelancers, designers, employees, I'm a client because I'm the boss. You're supposed to do work for me. I've hired architects, I've hired all sorts of people, attorneys, financial planners, those kinds of people. I want to be served well, I want to be treated with respect, and I want to be listened. So let's just take this example because everybody's been a client in this way. So this is the coolest image I can find for a hair salon. You can see I have a lot of experience with hair salons and we're going to talk about that a little bit. So let's say you guys go into a hair salon. You have amazing hair, right? And you, you tell the stylist, I'd like to get that Tom Cruise haircut. And they're like, okay, great, sit down. They put the bib around you, they start cutting. How do you feel about that? They just started. So the problem is Tom Cruise has been around for a long time. Like which Tom Cruise haircut are we talking about? Is this from <laughs> Risky Business, you know, where he slides out onto the stage? Is it that Tom Cruise? Is it um, the Jerry Maguire Tom Cruise? Tropic Thunder. What? <laughs> Tropic Thunder? Oh, you're right. People could barely tell which Tom Cruise that was. You know, or is it the Mission Impossible 15 Tom Cruise? Which Tom Cruise is that? Okay, so let's identify one. So that, that stylist is talking to you now and asking you and, and kind of probing to understand what you really mean. Okay, then they start cutting and we feel okay, right? Well, hold on a second. Well, my hair texture is a little bit different. I don't have any hair, right? <laughs> or maybe it's wavy or it's straight. Or maybe the, my face and the structure, maybe it's more round or pointed or square. So I want somebody, okay, all right, you want the Edge of Tomorrow Tom Cruise we're testing your movie trivia here. All right. People are like, oh, what? Okay, Edge of Tomorrow, Tom Cruise. And then they, they, they run their hands through your hair and they're like, okay, I get it. And look at your face. Okay, so here's the reality, Bob. Bob, I can't do that cut, but here's what I think you want and describe it to you based on your hair texture and the way that you part it and all that kind of stuff. Is that acceptable? Great, now they get into that. So now the relationship, you can walk out with a different set of expectations. You're not gonna look in the mirror and say, wow, I look just like Tom Cruise, because there's no way you're gonna do that. <coughs> but the expectations are set up for you to be able to walk away feeling great about the experience, and they took the time to listen to you, to hear you, and to personalize the service that they create just for you. And that makes you feel really good, right? So now I want you guys to think about that. That's what it's like to be a client. So think about in your own relationship, your own interactions, how you actually work with your client. All right, so part of that, this is point two, is having a clearly defined goal. As part of this kind of maker creative mentality, we're, we're really quick to rush out and make things without a real understanding of what the problem and the goal is. So what, what we come back with after working on it for weeks on end and we show our client something and they hate it, we have that kind of visceral reaction like, you're stupid, this is dumb, like you're getting in the way of my art. It's because we didn't take that time to understand what the goal is. We have a vague and abstract understanding of the objective. So another way to look at that is when somebody asks you to design a house, okay? Great, this is the house I want to design. It's John Pawson. He's an amazing minimalist architect. 
beautiful homes. I don't think anybody ever lives there because it's always perfect, right? <laughs> but before you go and dive into that, you want to ask some questions like, what kind of house? What style? Is it modern? Is it traditional Cape Cod? Is it Mediterranean, Spanish? What kind of style is it? And we don't want to just stop there. We want to dive a little deeper. Who's it for? How will it be used? Single family, bachelor, host parties? What do they do? How do they use it? Where will it be located? So there's a great quote that I love, and it's, you can't score if you don't know where the goal is. So what we have to do is define the goalposts as best as we can, and we have to use human language, not technical language or design language to talk to our clients about it. When you do that, you intimidate your clients, and what they do is they go along with what you say, because nobody wants to seem stupid. So when you ask them, is that site responsive, native, adaptive, like what? What are you talking about? Maybe you shouldn't even talk about that. Understand their users and their needs, and then prescribe a solution based on understanding that. Okay. So I want to test how well you guys have been listening. Okay. So I like to do this because I've timed this out, and I know I was running short, so I've added the game back in. So the game is called 21 Questions. All right. So you guys know how 21 Question goes. I'm going to think of a person. I've already thought of the person. This is all scripted. It's uh, real, imaginary, living or dead. Okay? And I'm going to make it a little harder for you because I see a, a, some really smart looking people here. Make it a little harder for you in that you can only ask yes or no questions. That's how it goes. Does everybody understand? So we've got to do this in five minutes because otherwise it will be over time. Okay? Are you guys ready? So you have 21 questions at the end of which we'll have three guesses. So I'm going to think of a person. Yeah, okay, got it. Okay, you guys ready? So here we go. Does anybody want to throw out the first question? Go ahead. Living or dead? Are they alive? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yes or no? <laughs> Are they alive? Yes? Are they imaginary? Yes? <laughs> yes? I'm, you know, I, okay, look, here's how it goes before I start harassing you guys. I give you three chances to screw it up. It's a yes or no question. If you ask me a not yes or no question, I'll just advance the clicker. You guys get it? Don't screw it up for this team. I've done this a couple of times. Actually, I've done this game many times. Only two teams have ever guessed it right. And it was a wild ass guess, a wag. Okay? I have no idea how they were able to guess. It was just totally random. So let's keep going. Yes. It's not me. Cartoon character. Yes. Are they short? Yes. Are they on TV? Yes. Bad hair, good hair, or no hair? Nope. No hair. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Are they on TV right now? Yes. No. Are they disabled? No. Are they human? No. Is Are it they a child? Yellow? What? Is it a kid? No. Because it's rather yellow. Are they animals? Wait, hold on. Are they yellow? That's what she just wrote. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Can I guess? Do you want to? Go ahead. Yes. Can I, 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 swear yes? No. No. Is it a fox? No. Are they animals? Yes. You guys are doing so great at the beginning, I was scared. <laughs> and then you guys went off the rails. You got too excited. You only have two more questions. And you're doing great on time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Just throw it out. You don't have to raise your hand. We're informal. Are they in the movies? Yes. No. All right, so now we're out of uh, questions. So now you have three guesses. So anybody wants to throw out a guess, they can. Go ahead. Is it Homer Simpson, guys? No. No, no is the answer. What, one more, uh, two more guesses. Go ahead. I saw a hand over here. You retract? Okay, you don't have to do it. You don't want to get shamed by everybody in the room. That's all right. <laughs> Go ahead. Is it Pikachu? Pikachu. 
Good guess. No. One more. It's a Tweety Bird. It's a Tweety Bird. No. All right. So it's it's an impossible game to win with twenty. You know, with a hundred people, it's it's tough. It's tough because. Well, let's talk about what you guys learned, okay? The first thing is there's a term called happy ears. Happy ears is a term that they use in sales a lot, and I didn't know this term until about a year and a half ago. It means you hear what you want to hear, that no matter what the client or the person says, if you think it's Homer Simpson, you just keep thinking it's Homer Simpson, even though somebody had asked, is it an animal? And I said, yes. <laughs> and is it small? Yes. So that would go against that. So you just hear what you want to hear. Another way of thinking about happy ears is you're on this locomotive train. It goes forward or it stops. It doesn't ever turn. So you want to have the ability to turn and maneuver a little bit here. Okay? And what we realize is it's very difficult to be an active listener. You have to quiet the thoughts in your head. You have to keep an open mind. And you have to let the evidence lead you to the next step. And the other thing you might have learned is asking is more important than talking. I saw some people taking notes, some people did not, so it becomes a lot clearer. So one of the other things that you want to learn about the way you ask questions is this. <clears throat> Each question should help to filter the realm of possibilities. So that's straightforward. So when somebody asks you to build a website that's very broad, open, and impossible to solve, you might get lucky, but I would not mistake luck with a good plan. Okay? So when we do this, this is a graph that I've created just for this game, and it makes it a lot easier to understand. There were basically two sets of variables. <clears throat> is the person real or imaginary? Right? And is the person real or imaginary? Imaginary. So we've eliminated half the realm of possibilities now. The next question was really, are they male or female? Do we know if it's male or female? Did I say that? Yeah. So there you are. I saw you taking notes. <laughs> I'm taking notes that you're taking notes, all right? So it's male. So like now we're down to 25%. It makes guessing a lot easier, right? So you might then say, is it older, adult, or child, right? So there can be some room for interpretation as to what's an adult, what's a child. But if you say it's a child and it's an older person, we're not going to mix, mix that up. So we want to reduce it down. I wasn't sure about the age of this particular person, but I kind of consider them an adult because they're not child or old, OK? Right. I don't have an animal graph on here, sorry. <laughs> I, I cannot, I'm not omniscient, and I cannot see the future, so I do not know all your questions. It would be amazing if I did, huh? I'd be really good. Very valuable at that point. So then we're trying to determine if this person is in the movies or in book or, or, or TV. So the kinds of questions that you ask have to be very specific at points now. So we start broad, and then we get really specific. So you said, are they on film? Well, Almost everything's on film now. Almost everything that's a film is now also on TV. So the kind of question you might want to ask is, did this character originate in film, TV, or a book? So he's paying attention. You're going to do really well in this lecture here. I could see that already. You guys watch out for him. So the character originated in books, as far as I know. And the character is Garfield. Right? So right, when you ask yellow, I had to pause. I'm like, yes? So then you have to pay attention to the nuance of the way I answer. A lot of questions I was able to answer yes or no because it was very clear. So active listening is also about reading my body language and my tone. Okay? So I hope that helps you out a little bit. So I'm going to recap here. Right. That could have been a good follow-up. So here's the other thing. We're working with group dynamics. And for a different kind of conference, I would say, well, what did we learn about group dynamics? It's hard for us to agree to strategy. People aren't paying attention. We're not all playing on the same team, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not doing that today. This is really about clients, right? So what you want to do is you want to keep an open mind. You want to ask questions to narrow the possibilities. So you start as broad as possible. You want to cut this thing in half each and every time if you can. And when it gets narrower, now you have a hypothesis as to what it could possibly be. And then it's time to get very specific about the kind of questions and be careful of vague and open-ended questions. Now, you can see some of you guys may be frustrated and feel like I've cheated you. And that's totally OK, because I am sometimes a cheater and I frustrate people. <laughs> but not intentionally, most of the time. All right? So the thing is, when you ask your clients, oh, is it graphic? They're like, yeah, it's graphic. Great, you go and do this thing. Well, graphic means a lot of things to a lot of people. 
that you ask a vague question, you get vague answers. And then you're like upset. Now, now who should be upset then? You should be upset at yourself. You're, you're the person to blame, really. You set yourself up for failure. And there's ways that you can avoid that. Okay? Start broad, get specific, and then just listen. Okay. So now assuming that after 10 minutes of talking about this, you're an expert at listening and asking questions and defining goals. You're amazing. But you'll still run into problems. You will. So there's this term, it's called mental jujitsu, mental judo, mental chess, whatever it is, right, kinetic. You're going to think about how to do this. And there's an image of here. If you guys know anything about martial arts, I'm a martial arts fan, not a practitioner. Don't fight me later, right? <laughs> Karate is like hard hand-to-hand, -hand, like striking, and it's a lot of power and brute strength. Jiu-jitsu, on the other hand, is using leverage and positioning. And this is a concept I learned not too long ago. Okay, what we want to do is when we're confronted with an objection from our client, after having listened to them very carefully and showing them work, is what we want to do is embrace and what we want to do is pivot so that we're both on the same team. Just think about that a little bit, embrace and pivot. And there's some, there's some other ways of understanding this, right? And it comes to the way we are as human beings. If you're walking down the street and somebody walks straight at you, right staring right at you, walking right in your line, you're going to come into a collision. And you have to make a decision. Am I going to fight or am I going to run away? Those aren't two good decisions that you want to put your client in. Now imagine a person's walking next to you, side by side. And they lean over and it's like, oh, did you see that thing down the street? That's not confrontational. What we want to do is we want to be facing the same direction as our clients. And it's hard. So here's an example. This is a very easy example to illustrate the point. The clients will almost always say this, make it bigger. This fascination with size, make it bigger. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Okay. So if you confront them head on, like my opening slide, you're going to get that, that friction. So you say, no, we should keep it small because it's tasteful and that's, that's gross, that's clumsy, that's awkward, it's weird, it's un inelegant, it's all those things. What you're doing is you're forcing your client to dig into their position because there's a need on a psychological level for us to be consistent. So if I say big and you say small, I fight. Even if I don't really believe in big, I just meant bigger than small, like medium big, right? <laughs> but now I have to keep defending myself and you're going to paint the client into a corner forcing yourself to then deal with this thing, right? So there's this need to be consistent. And one way around this is, and it's a great principle just for about anything in your life, is to ask why three times. Because when you ask why three times, you get to the root of what it is. Right? So the client says, make it big. You're like, oh, big, that's interesting. Why do you say that? Well, you know, the type is yellow and the background's white, and I'm having a hard time reading, and, and you know, my vision isn't that great. And oh, so you really you're talking about a contrast issue, not so much a size issue. So if I chose a darker shade of yellow, do you think that might work? Oh, yeah. Okay. Why don't I show you that at our next meeting, and you tell me, and then we'll decide if we should make it bigger. They've heard. They know that I've heard them, and I'm going to address it with the proper solution. So this is addressing the need versus the want. Okay? You're, you're getting into the deeper part of it. Are you serious? Did you really start at the time? Oh, yeah, you're right. I have to speed this up. Okay. Maybe I won't talk about selling so much. You guys want me to talk about selling? No. Okay, I'll skip that. Well, now I go past the sale. And then when you remember, me, 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 me. All right, hold on. <laughs> okay, I can end this in five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll, we'll go. Screw that. You know what? Donald Trump doesn't re re respect the rules. Neither will I. It's, it's very much in fashion right now. Screw it. I'm here to deliver value. Okay, so... Selling sucks. It sucks to sell and we hate selling. And the reason why is because we have a horrible experience with salespeople, the car salesperson, the door-to-door -door salesperson, put his foot in the door, like can't, the telemarketer and the retail experience. Like when I go into a retail store, when you guys go into a retail, retail store of some kind of aspirational brand, you're already uncomfortable to begin with because, hey, let's face it, we're not as fashionable as we'd like to be and we're not in the best shape of our lives. So we go in there and we just, we just want to shop a little bit. Just leave us alone, right? But then that person, very persistent and aggressive, is like, can I help you? Can it, why don't you try this? You know that looks great on you. I, I. So we have this reaction. So I need 
to help you guys flip the concept of what it is to sell. And to me, selling is about providing a solution to a problem. If there's no problem, I'm not selling. Okay, and I believe in what I do, and I believe in the value and the impact that I can make on a company's business, that it'll actually affect their bottom line to improve their system, their process. So I'm not selling anything, I'm providing a value. If I can't do that, I'm, I'm moving away. So the thing that you want to start thinking about is, is there a problem that you can solve? And so one way you can broach that, if you're having a meeting with somebody, you can just say, tell me what it's like in a day in your life at work. What kind of pain points do you have? What are the struggles? And you could change that to, tell me the pain points you have with the website. What are some of the problems that you're feeling that you have? And then you're thinking to yourself, are any of these things things I can solve? Maybe you're an SEO expert, an SEM person, whatever it is, a conversion person. Think about that. So you want to direct the question towards something that you might be able to solve. Two minutes, huh? All right. So for me, I want to know, if, can, is there a problem to solve? Can I solve it? And sometimes I can't. Some clients want me to do work for amounts of dollars uh, that don't work for me. I want to know that right up front. I don't want to spend three meetings finding out they only have $2,000 to launch an e-commerce site. I can't do that. Some people can, I can't. And so for me, a lot of times it's, can they afford me? All right. So here's the way that you do it the wrong way. I, I consider it like blindsiding the client. And you ask for it right at the front. So you're talking, how are the kids, da, 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 da. so why don't you hire me? That's really awkward. Think about that ram, those two rams going against it. And people do this to me all the time. One of you guys might do it later today. So when are you going to hire me? It's like, hey, get to know me a little bit. So if they're not rapport, like take me out for dinner first. I mean, let's just, you know, give me a flower or something. You just want to jump to it, right? Okay, and I'll do this really fast because I know I'm one minute and 18 seconds over time. I know that. Stop harassing me, dude. <laughs> Going past the sale, I want to tell you about this, okay? People do this all the time because we put so much work into our idea, our effort. Once the client says yes, shut up. Just shut up. Stop. People don't realize this. and They just keep talking and talking, and you'll talk yourself out of the sale. Really fast story. You guys know Jordan Belfort. He's the Wolf of Wall Street. He's a real person, not a fictional thing. And if you watch some of his videos, he has a story to tell, and I'll tell it really fast. He says, I'm ready to buy a Mercedes. I have money. I'm making money. I'm killing it. I go into the Mercedes dealership and I say, I want to buy this car. The, the salesperson says, let me show you about the features. Have you driven this before? The tire seat. And he's like, so frustrated, he just walked out. So he goes to the BMW dealership. He's like, I want to buy this car. The guy's like, great. Let's get the paperwork going. He's like, this is great. He sits down, they're working on the paperwork. He sees that there's a photo on the back and his kid plays basketball. He's like, oh, your kid plays basketball. The guy's like, oh, let me tell you about my kid. He's the star. He goes into the store. He's like, thank you very much. He leaves. He goes to the Porsche dealership. I want to buy this car. Let's do the paperwork. Here's the keys. Thank you. Drove away. <laughs> when somebody's ready to buy, shut up and get out of the way. Yes, shut up. All right? And if they say no, ask why. Because you can turn the negative into a positive. You can learn something from that. All right? I'm sorry I'm out of time. Thank you very much. Oh, I have time for Q&A. What's that? What's your YouTube channel? The YouTube channel is The School Rocks or something like that. I'm easy to find because I, I try not to make what I do and what I think a secret. I'm on Instagram, Twitter. If you guys want to hit me up for anything, contact me on Twitter. I just finally got my name. So I had to use the before. I'm not an egomaniac. All right, so I have both, but I, I only really respond to the first one that I've been working on, okay? I write articles on LinkedIn on this very stuff, YouTube, whatever. Is there Q&A now? Yeah, um, what, no? take three questions. I'll take three questions, or not. <laughs> I'll do a little dance. <laughs> No, I want you to ask open-ended questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ask open-ended questions because you want to do discovery. Discovery does not come from what's your favorite color, right? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. Smart guy. I work in another business as well as just defense contracts and graphics. And our thing is who's the client and what do they need provided? And often if you're dealing with a small business person, it's all about, well, I like this color. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. You know, 
the, here's how I do it. You, okay, just to be clear, smart guy asked this question. He said that a lot of times my clients just want to talk about themselves. That's all they want to do. So their website's like, we do this, we're that, we're the best, we're whatever it is, right? And just say to them, when you meet somebody and they, all they do is talk about themselves, how do you feel about that person? I want to get out of the room. But the person was like, what do you do? What motivates you? What inspires you? Tell me a day in your life. What, what struggles are you dealing with? So the, the way I do is I pivot. They go like this. They talk about themselves for a long time. I say, that's all great, but I've found that in my practice, when we start to think about who our customers are and the, more, the customers we'd like more of, and we look at it from their perspective, we can do some really effective marketing. And we can uncover their pain points, and the better aligned their pain points are to what we provide, the more valuable we become. Okay, they're listening now. So I'll just listen for a little bit. And sometimes if we're short on time, I'll say, I've, I meet with a lot of creative entrepreneur CEO types, and your inclination is to do the brain dump. You guys know the brain dump? It's like everything out in my head, and you just give me stuff, but without context and a framework, it's just talking, and I can't keep up. I have no idea what I should be listening to and what I shouldn't be listening to. Let's start, and you guys know this because you guys are user experience designers, you work in the web. Understanding the user's needs and designing for that experience is key. Okay, I, I think there's a couple more questions over here. Or maybe I killed them all. You know, I don't value the work that I do in the kind of art that I get to make. Like, I buy art and I like to draw, but I don't impose that on my clients per se. So what I like to look at is, who can I help? What problems can I solve? And the project may not be one that wins every award. I'm not really interested in that because I've won a lot of awards and I've not changed my life at all. They really haven't, okay? Because most people just don't care. They don't care that you won the, throw out an award. I've won an Webby award, nobody cares. <laughs> throw out another award. <laughs> Whatever it is, nobody cares, right? Oscar, I haven't won that, I'm working on that. <laughs> It's just more a checklist than anything else, you know what I mean? There's a back door, I'm working on the back door technique. You go in the front door, it's very competitive, right? So solve the client's problem, become valuable to them. Right now, this company that we're working with, their stock is really low. It's a, a quarter of where it used to be just a, six months ago. They're getting a beating on Wall Street right now. Because I went on the website, I can't understand it, it speaks robot, totally does. Nobody can understand it. And they try to explain it to you, they speak like robots. So then a day I had to raise my hand after like an hour of talking to them. I said, you know what? I need you to speak human to me. Speak to me like I'm a fifth grader because that's how your other clients feel and think. That's who your customers are. Stop trying to use jargon, acronyms, and industry uh, you know, words that are hype. It doesn't mean anything to anybody. And I can help. So if their stock goes up, just double, like half of what it was worth before, guess who gets to take some of that credit? And, and they're like, uh, you know, they're gonna be a billion dollar company. That's valuable, don't you think? Now your, your graphic design service seems like a bargain. I don't care what you charge at that point, because if you can help people in that way, you're worth every penny and more. I look at it as high ROI, return on investment. Okay, thanks for that question. That was like a plug for myself, but all right. <laughs> Okay, here's the money.